Okay, uh, what we're going to talk about today is uh, Impressionism and a little bit about Claude Monet, the leader of the Impressionist movement. Here we have Claude Monet. Here's a photograph of him. And Claude Monet understood, and the Impressionist artist, understood some very scientific things about how the eye works and how the brain works. And they used that scientific information that they had, that knowledge that they had, to bring about a new painting uh, technique called Impressionism. And we're going to talk about some of the things they scientifically knew here. Okay, first of all, they knew and understand that <clears throat> when, you, when you have paint, when you have paint on a palette and you mix the primaries, you get the secondary colors, you know, the, the yellow and the blue, you know, make green and those sorts of things that you've learned your whole life. But sometimes uh, what you don't under, what we don't, aren't taught sometimes is that when it comes with colored light, it doesn't mix like paint does. What happens is you might have a red light beamed onto the wall or the, or the screen, and if you get a green light and you mix it with it on the screen, it'll come out yellow. And then when you have blue and you mix the green and, and, the, and the red, and you mix all these colors, it turns white. So white is the presence of all color. So if you want a pure white, it's the presence of all colors. Where it's different over here, when you start dealing with pigments, uh, it turns more to a black color. So here we go. <clears throat> when we talk about uh, a light source. So up here we have a light source, we have a sun, or we have a light bulb, or whatever we have. And when you turn, if you're in a, if you're in a room and it's all dark, it's black because there's no light, you don't see anything. But when you flip that switch and the light turns on, the presence of all color is in that room. And, and beams of light, all the rainbow just rapidly bounces all over the room. It hits all the surfaces in that room. So the light turns on, all the color travels through the room, and hits the surfaces in the room. And in this particular case, we have an apple. So all the color light of the rainbow hits this apple. This apple absorbs all the colors of the rainbow and then some and then it but it reflects the red light the red light bounces off the apple and goes into our eye and we perceive that's where the apple is this is how it goes a little further so what happens here <coughs> when you turn on a light or the sun or a light source hits the top of the stop sign it bounces the light bounces off the the stop sign it travels into the opening of the eye and goes to the back of the eye and then the light comes down and hits the bottom of the stop sign and it travels through the opening of the eye and hits the back of the eye so you can see right here that we actually see things upside down that's how human beings see other animals have radar other animals have different ways of doing things but with the human being we have light that bounces off objects hits the object when the light bounces off the object, it travels into your eye, into the back of your eye, and you perceive it. But because how things are, and they travel through the open of the eye, we actually see things upside down. And that's just a physical thing, how our eye works. But then you're kind of thinking, well, wait a minute, why don't we see everything upside down? I'm not seeing things upside down. But what happens is this. The tree is right side up. It goes into the eye, and you see it upside down. This data now goes from your eye to your brain. And our brains are absolute incredible organs. It's absolutely incredible what your brain does here. What your brain does is your brain knows it's right side up, so your brain flips it right side up, and you perceive that it is right side up. So it's pretty amazing uh, what the eye does. Remember, white light is the, is the presence of all color, all color comes off the white light and goes through the air at the speed of light. Light travels from the sun to the earth at eight and a half minutes. That's very, very, very fast. So, the, so it all hits, all the colors hit this apple. This apple absorbs all color except for red. The red bounces off and the red goes into your eye. The objects are upside down. And then this information that's upside down goes to your brain and your brain actually flips it right side up. You know, another thing to understand also is that when, because of this open in our eye, we actually have a blind spot right in the middle of our vision. And it's just a blank. 
There's just nothing there. But what happens is our brain is so smart and it gets so much data so rapidly, your brain will fill in that blind spot with data that it thinks it's there. It's that brilliant, that fast, and it's absolutely incredible what the human eye does and what the brain does with the information, the data that it gets there. So here we come to Claude Monet. Claude Monet is going to paint the same thing at one time of day, another time of the day, another time of the year, another time of the year, another time of the day. He actually paints the same thing. But what's happening here is the Impressionists are understanding that we are not painting, Claude Monet is not painting a haystack. He's painting the light reflecting off that haystack. Hence, we have an impression of the haystack, so we have the term Impressionism. So, if he's painting a haystack in the uh, midday, and then he's painting it in wintertime, the light is completely different. So an Impressionist is considering this painting a different image than the painting we saw you know, here or here. It's a different painting because the light is different. It's a different object because it's different. And that's kind of the premise that they come by. We have this reflecting light coming off images going into our eye, going into our brain, and our brain processes that information. And so the the, the Impressionist artists are simply painting reflecting light. We're not painting objects. And that comes to this kind of interesting painting right here. This is a painting uh, <clears throat> that I was very familiar with. And then uh, it was about, about 1986 or so, I went with my wife to Paris. Uh, we took a train from London to, to uh to Southampton and took a ferry to Le Havre across the English Channel, got in a train and went from Lav to Paris. I get off the train in Paris, and I stand in this grand, big uh, train station, and I get off the train, and I turn to my wife, I said, I've been here before. I and my wife said, no, you've never even been to France. No way have you been to Paris, you haven't even been to France. And I said, no, stop, stop, stop. I know I've been here before. It was a really eerie feeling that I had. And then I, and after about five, ten minutes, I figured something out. I figured out that I'd known this painting right here, which was painting in the 1880s. And in the 1980s, I'm standing in the train, same train station. Now, if I had seen a photograph of the train station, I would have gotten off the train, and I would have said, oh, this is the Paris train station. I recognize it because I've seen a photograph of that image before. But that's not what Claude Monet has done here. Claude Monet has done a painting of the reflecting light, which gives us a feeling of the train station, a very powerful feeling of the train station. So when I went to the train station, I wasn't recognizing the train station, but I was recognizing the feeling of being there and seeing the train station. And it was really fairly interesting because that happened. So what happens is when, when Claude Monet... <coughs> When he did a lot of his paintings, he did at his home in Giverny. That's north of Paris. They take about a 45-minute drive north of Paris, and you get to Giverny. And what he does is he, he dammed up the river and had this pond. He has a Japanese bridge. He has these, uh, these trees and flowers and irises and all these, these lily pads and everything. It's this beautiful, beautiful place. But you've got to realize that when Claude Monet is painting these images... From Giverny, he's painting the reflecting light. So therefore, if you ask my wife, what's your favorite place to go in the world? We've traveled all over the place, and she'll say Giverny. She enjoys going to Giverny more than anything else, because it's just not one painting like the train station. You're going from objects that Monet painted his whole life, his whole painting career, he painted images of reflecting light from his garden. So here's a Japanese bridge right here. And if you go further later on, same Japanese bridge, but in a, in a, in a, in a, uh, during a sunset of intense light, light is bouncing off all over the place. He understands that, and he's thinking, he's knowing, he's painting reflecting light. So what happens is when you go to Giverny, and you walk from spot to spot to spot to spot, you are having that same feeling that 
I had when I was in the train station, you're having every moment as you pass. You'll stay there for an hour and just walk around, go over the bridge, and you go over everything, and, you're, and, you're, and you're, your, your feelings that you feel are very, very powerful. Now, if you're not familiar with Claude Monet and you haven't visually seen those, it's just a pond with lily pads in it and flowers. But if you have made that connection with Claude Monet by, by seeing his paintings that were for reflected light, and you've internalized that, now you'll feel what he was trying to portray to you. And it actually is very, very powerful and a really cool thing to do. Now, I'm going to take a, a step here to an artist named George Surratt. Now, George Surratt does Sunday afternoon here, and George Surratt does paintings with dots. He doesn't do brush strokes at all. He's just doing dot, 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 dot. And what George Surratt is doing here, which is really super, super cool, is George Surratt, is, he, he takes his palette, and he has the canvas, and he puts dots on it, color number one, dot, 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 dot. He gets color number two, dot, 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 dot. Color number three, dot, 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 on the canvas. So when the light hits the canvas, and that light bounces off the canvas, goes into our eye, our eye then transmits that information to our brain, our brain then processes that information. And George Surratt studied, uh, and became very knowledgeable about, when you do that, if you do the right dot, 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 color number one, color number two, color number three, if you do those in certain uh, sequences, when that, those three dots go into your brain, your brain actually mixes color number one, two, three together, and you get color number four. So actually, uh, you have George Surratt, who is actually putting dots of color number one, two, three on the canvas, and when the light hits that canvas, it goes into our eye, goes into our brain, and our brain mixes additional colors that are actually not on the canvas. You are actually seeing colors that are not even there. So George Surratt, he knows and understands what's going on with, with the color light. And it's a pretty amazing thing. Now, what we're going to be doing is we're going to talk uh, next, not in, this, not in this thing, but we're going to be talking about Van Gogh with the post-impressionist and what's happening right here. Uh, this takes Starry Night and some of his other paintings, take it to the next level beyond what George Surratt was doing. And we're going to talk about that another time. So remember, we have Claude Monet, who's the leader of the, of the Impressionist movement. He understands that all light gives us white. So white light is all light. All color goes through the air, hits an object. An object retains, it absorbs all those colors except for the red that bounces off. It goes into our eye, upside down. The information goes to our brain, and our brain processes that information. So what's happening is... The Impressionists know and understand that we don't see objects in the world. We simply see their reflecting light. And therefore, we see an impression of objects, so hence we call it Impressionism.